I don't think I'll ever get used to wearing a mask, but this is a place that we are currently required to wear a mask. So, here we go. just arrived inside and there are a few things that are a little bit different in the post COVID-19 era. We do have to wear masks. The interactive displays have been temporarily turned off and they do ask you to wash your hands once you come in. Now the galleries are divided up into two or three different sections and so we're in the first one right now doing our self-guided tour through the Nimitz Museum. The Nimitz Museum was opened in February just before everything happened and so it's in pristine condition. As we first move into the museum we find this very large timeline. This is great because it's going to set the tone for what we're going to be seeing inside this exhibit. For those of you who are not familiar with Fredericksburg, Texas, it is primarily a German community. This particular community has a rich history, and amongst this history is one particular man, Admiral Nimitz. Now, the museum itself, whenever you come up, you can't miss it. It looks like no other building in the downtown area. It is very cool. And then when you get inside, there are all of these pieces that go along with his story and his life. A huge huge massive amount of work has been put into this museum and the details are so amazing. This was a pocket watch that was given to Chester Nimitz and it is engraved and in amazing condition. This one right here is especially interesting between 1926 and 1929 around the time of Hiroshima Commander Nimitz was one of the officers elected to establish the first Naval Reserve officer training. And this is the group. As we move through this section, we find out that Admiral Nimitz was actually asked to lead one of the main fleets there in Pearl Harbor, but he declined it because he thought other people were more qualified. Later on, he was then told he basically had to, and uh, it was interesting, but uh, continues on with the story following post Pearl Harbor. This is one of the stuffed toy goats that was given to him in Guam. And then as we move down, this is a plaque that was found in a tunnel under Chester Nimitz's former headquarters in Hawaii, a silver plated souvenir horseshoe. And then down here we have a program from the Old Texas Roundup admittance card to the old Texas Roundup and a photograph of the time at the old Texas Roundup. This is how they are currently closing the touch exhibits for the COVID-19. So this I'm hoping will be open by the time that you visit. This vase was presented to the National Museum of the Pacific War by the people of Admiral Togo's hometown in Japan. It was a friendship gift to celebrate the friendship that the admirals had with in that time. This is, this is the 105 millimeter artillery shell that was fired to salute him at his funeral. And then the dress sword with a script engraving presented by the officers to Nimitz. This flag was the insignia flown at his headquarters in Guam. And then as we move over, here is the man himself, Admiral Nimitz. Additional precautions being taken around the museum to ensure our safety, we have sanitizer. Okay, so we have just left the Nimitz portion of the gallery and now we're moving over to the Pacific War Museum itself. And I am so excited now to see the larger museum, which apparently is over a mile around whenever you're walking. As we pass through these walls, this is considered to be the memorial wall. Chester Nimitz wanted specifically to share this space with all of those who had served. So each of these plaques indicates an individual who served and these are so detailed. There's photos on most of them. It tells a little bit about each person. And then in addition to that, you also have the brick walkway right below us. So we're going to walk around and learn about some of these people and their stories. Just 
went to a museum which covered a lot of different things mentioning the war and there was one room there that was huge and it was filled with names and those were all the people that were lost during the war uh, World War One, World War Two, on and on. Coming here, it's different than seeing just a name on a wall. You see the name, but you see the person. And so it makes it a little more difficult because anyone can see a name, but it's hard to relate to just a name. But there's no denying whenever you look at someone's photo and say, wow, that person, and then you look at another one, wow, that person, that person, that person, and the walls just keep going on and on. This person was part of the 34th Bomb Group squadron. This one was with the amphibious forces landing craft. This one was electrician's mate. And, and this is a man who actually survived the altercations, and they still wanted to memorialize his service here, he lived right here in Texas. He was a survivor. This group of young men were brothers, the Clarity Brothers. And much like the brothers, these two also were within the same family. Mine is just one of many that talk about aircraft carriers. And we did visit an aircraft carrier when we went to the Lexington. I can't get super close, but I am 5'6", five, 5'7", five, depending on, you know, who's measuring me. And this part right here by itself is about the same height. So we're looking at at least two of me tall. And then the blades, the blades, if I were to lay down, are about two and a half to three feet taller than me, each one of them. So right here is the USS Lexington. This is the one that we actually toured when we went to Corpus Christi. And if you didn't catch that video, I would definitely suggest going and checking it out. Visiting one of these ships is kind of a really unique experience that you won't want to miss out on because it's something unlike anything else. When we are on the Lexington, I will say this. I knew it was big, but I had no idea how big it really was until we started touring it. And you go through multiple levels and you see these close, tight quarters that people would have stayed in for a really long time while they were out at sea. And it puts things into perspective in a whole different way. People think that New York City apartments are small. They have never been on one of these ships before, clearly. Now, before we move into the main museum over here, I want you to do something for me at home. I want you to stop and think about all of these plaques, all of these people. They were brothers. They were uncles. They were friends. They were fathers. And in some cases, they were sisters, aunts, mothers, all of them. All of this happened and those were real people. And think about that next time that you think about the history books, the, the faces that didn't exist because they were just text. Think about this right here. And uh, I challenge you to think about the people who have served in your area, who have helped and really try to support them because it's important, it's very important. Okay guys, here is a map of the overall grounds that we're at right now. We are about to go into the Plaza of the Presidents, which is going to let us know a little bit about all of the presidents that served during the war. Under each one of these presidential seals, we find one president. So FDR is right here and they have a photo, a quote, and then also what he did as a part of the service. This was H.W. Bush before the presidency. He was actually known to be the youngest aviator at the time. Gerald Ford joined shortly after Pearl Harbor and became a fitness instructor for future pilots. Now, Ronald Reagan was an actor, and most people know that, but whenever the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, he decided to hang up his acting for a little while and join the army. 
and he did that in 1942. You will find that there are 10 different presidents within this area and each one of them has that same bio with the quote, what they did in the service, and then the time that they served. So that's very informative. I really like that they also have a photo so you can kind of see what they might have looked like at that time versus when we might have known them later on in history. We finished with the Hall of Presidents. It's time for us to move inside to the main gallery now. So we have to make sure that the time frame is correct. We have to reserve a time. So we have reserved our timestamp and we're just now waiting for them to open the door. They do this on a limited basis to make sure that there aren't too many people in the gallery at a time. Now, if you're visiting after all of the restrictions have lifted, things will be completely different. However, right now, that's just kind of how it is. This section, as soon as we come in right here, is the HA-19 Midget Submarine. Now, we were just told that originally there were five of these and they came into Pearl Harbor. One of them, had gotten completely lost in the mix and ran the actual submarine aground and they were able to recover it. And if you'll notice right here, this courthouse is the Gillespie County Courthouse, which is right here in Fredericksburg. Because Admiral Nimitz was from this area, they actually brought this submarine through downtown in a parade style. And here is a portion of it that we can actually look into. They have retrofitted it with these little windows so we can see how much space would have been inside. It was originally 80 feet long and as you can see most of it was just for cargo right here. These back three windows right here are the only three windows where the crew would have actually been so it's very claustrophobic and small and then there's a little space in the back back there. Now we move down the hall and past the bookstore which we will stop in after because I'm sure that there are a few things in here that'll be definite points of interest for us. Okay, we are moving into the main section, and as soon as we enter, there is a large orientation theater. So we're going to be watching a short video in this massive room right here. In the decade before Queens and Guam, the next day, the Congress of the United States declared war on the Empire of Japan. Two days later, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States video quality was the best I have seen. That was amazing and it's interactive. We are going into East meets West and we start with the seeds of conflict. Now before we move any further, I just want to have a little heart to heart with you guys, my audience. We're going to look at a lot of different things within this museum today. Some of them you may or may not agree with. Some of them you may or may not want to see and I understand. I won't be offended if you click off of the video, but this is a real representation of war and what happened. And I want to share that with you in its entirety. Within Japan, there was a struggle. Their civilians and military were at war with one another. They were scaling up for a total war and something terrible was on the horizon. It was at this point that the arms race began between Japan and the United States. As you can see here, this is a super battleship. It was constructed as a part of the Japanese military force. It was the Yamato, and as you can see, it was 72,800 tons. This is a comparable ship from the United States, the USS North Carolina, 33 and a half tons. So this right here is Thanksgiving Day Parade, something that is cherished here in the United States as something that we do every year. The large balloons marching down. And as you can see here, 11 days before the attack on Pearl Harbor, life was normal. There was Nothing that was strange going on. And as you can see, Japan was not 
viewing America well. There were a number of reasons for this. Escalating tensions had occurred for many years and it had continued to climb. In the spring of 1940, Germany swept into France and the Low Countries and they were backed up at the English Channel. The British troops evacuated from Dunkirk, abandoning their equipment on the beaches. In 40 days, Hitler became the master of Europe. It was a quiet and sleepy morning in October. It was a Sunday, so ships mostly were running at a skeleton crew. Not many people were on board. However, there were people who were active and moving around whenever five submarines entered into the area. These five submarines were all coming to wreak havoc. There was a plan that was being implemented and carried out and most Americans had no idea as to what was even going on. said by the president at the time that it was the day that would live in infamy and it was the day that the United States truly truly entered the war so many people perished and so many were injured and the impact of bringing the war to the actual United States itself it was unforgivable so from this point forward we move into a state of shock and anger in retaliation. And the next room that we're going into shows a little bit more of that response directly. Now this right here is something that is extremely special. For those who are not as familiar with American history, the USS Arizona was one of the ships that was sunk in Pearl Harbor. The crew was still inside and the ship as a whole still rests on the floor of the ocean to this day. There is a special location that you can visit in Hawaii and to see something like this, to know that people were stuck inside, not able to get assistance in any way, shape, or form, and that they perished, is something that will really make you understand the sobriety. This was the official Japanese declaration of war. And we also have a few other items inside this case. And here we also have a few things, including a Purple Heart and Death Certificate for one of the USS Shaw members. There is a blood-stained armband worn on the USS Utah. Even a cocktail fork. Right here we talk about the Japanese Americans that were exiled. Now this is a part of history that a lot of people are not as familiar with. They were moved to relocation camps. The reason for this at the time was that no one knew who had infiltrated the United States and so they wanted to make sure that none of these people were what we would now call terrorists. Now in more present days we know that that portion of this history was very similar in the grand scheme of things as putting people in concentration camps of sort. The treatment was much better, but still, it's mind-blowing to look at that today and think that that's what was done. The Japanese attacks were not isolated to the United States. They had moved slowly 
into lots of other places. They actually had taken over many areas of Indochina. And in doing so, they had gained quite a bit of ground in that area. This can be seen through this entire area as you read. There are several different incidents. I think one of the biggest differences in the infiltration of other areas versus the infiltration of the United States was the United States had a much larger armed forces and they had the ability to fight back and they weren't going to stand by and allow atrocities to happen. So after being attacked, they took it upon themselves to then fight back and defend because if they hadn't have, the continental United States could have been next. It might have been well beyond just what happened in Hawaii. This is what it might have looked like on one of those flight decks of one of the carriers that we had looked at, similar to the Lexington. As you can see here, they started U.S. fleet operations for April 1942, and it was a direct result of the Japanese submarine torpedoed the USS Neches. Now, within this trip around the museum, I just want you to be aware that this is telling the bits and pieces of the story to you through this video. By no means can this video communicate the entire story. Many of us have learned through history about the Battle of Midway, but we're going inside to learn a little bit more. He has orders from his superior at Within this area of Midway, we also have some interesting artifacts as well. This is the Japanese Vice Admiral's jacket. He is believed to have been wearing this in the mid-1930s. There is a Time magazine published in 1942. And down here we have a bubblegum card and also a collar insignia. Here we have a Hawaiian ukulele and cover owned by Dyer. And then also some other things that were associated with Thomas Dyer. He was a person who received a Distinguished Service Medal at the Battle of Midway. Now throughout the museum you will find things like this, these massive, massive murals. And they all are from photographs that were actually taken at the time of conflict. Behind me you'll see this massive gun and this was actually one of the Japanese guns. It had a three inch bullet and it could go up to 26,000 feet. That's massive and we just saw a tank, we've seen some of the planes. There are a lot of these different pieces that paint the full picture here. A few more interesting items here. We have featured a U.S. Kapuk life jacket, a five-inch shell, USS Chicago cruise book, ship recognition model of the USS Chicago. Now this right here is one of my favorite features that a lot of museums are starting to integrate. They are these larger screens that are at a level that you can interact. Of course right now we can't touch, but typically these are touch-based screens and they show you a lot more details. This bell was the official bell from the fleet oiler, the USS Sabine. This vessel was actually originally named the SS Esso Albany until it acquired later on by the Navy and became the Sabine in the 1940s. As we walk over this, the sounds that we might hear as we were leaving one of the vessels and charging onto the land are playing. And they're screaming and bullets and it's loud and it sounds chaotic. You can hear planes overhead. It's an experience that when you pass over gives you a very small taste of what it would be like to actually have been there.
behind me, as you can see, it says Marines under fire. It mentions that they would crawl on their bellies and be shot at, and they would have to find a way to a safe haven, all the while trying to take out the enemy. And that had to be, for a person who's never been in a conflict like that, that had to have been one of those things that was so unimaginable and the feeling had to be one of fear and terror and you're angry and you just want to live at that point. The museum is so large, guys, that there are maps placed kind of throughout so you can locate where you are and where you're going. So as you can see, we are only on number 11 right here. And the exhibits go all the way up to 36. So we have quite a few more to go. This behind me is one of the original smart bombs. This was the first kind of smart technology that they were using in the military. Very different than what we see today. This sign was actually used by the 27th Seabees. And this uniform was a khaki uniform that was worn by the PT boat captain, Ensign Ken W. Prescott. Within this case, we have two wheels from the USS Radford. Now, as we move through this hall, again, we find more of the massive artillery that was being used, and it lines the sides of both of the rooms. There are so many of these here, and it just kind of puts into perspective the size of the artillery itself. Jeeps like these began to roll out of America right and left. 2.4 million trucks of all descriptions for the military use were created and the Jeep was originally designed in Pennsylvania. In addition, you can see that a lot of people had come together to roll out in industries that formerly were not manufacturing things. They turned their efforts to the war and created many things that were used. This jacket was decorated with insignia patches collected by Lou McNair. It was said that she attended USO dances at Camp Swift near Bastrop and also at Bergstrom Air Force Base near Austin. As we move into the next section, there are things going on all around us. There is a speaker overhead, a table that has information, and what looks to be a command center. This is, in fact, a cruiser bridge right here. So this is showing you each individual section where a person would be working and they do have a captain's chair. Overhead there is a narration that tells you a little bit more about what's actually going on within one of these cruisers. And there is a small screen that allows you to see what you are hearing also. So it's very inclusive. Loose lips sink ships. Censored. Right here, it looks like we're moving into an area that is going to talk about the various medias throughout this time. Now again, if you are watching this, these are actual things that ran at the time. That does not mean that is reflected in the current climate of today. So if you are seeing these, definitely know that these were something that was going on at the time of the war not currently. For example, this one, loose lips sink ships, might sink ships rather. Someone talked. It says here that Congress shall make no law 
respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free speech exercises. Now in today's climate, of course, that is very relevant. Free speech is a big thing, even today. And so that one is a sign that at the time somebody might not have agreed with, but it was free speech. So we need to keep that in mind and uh, just kind of move forward. In this poster, we see two people working together and it says, United We Win. Additionally, they have some other images here and it talks about that this is a people's war and the people are entitled to know as much as possible about it. Again, in today's climate, things are viewed a little bit differently. Um, for the protection of those serving, a lot of times all the details are not shared. But at the same time, united we win should be something we say today. We can't get through all of the craziness in this world unless we band together. So keep that in mind. Here we find that movies were actually created even during war times to focus on spreading the war information and also encouraging people to buy war bonds. This is an entire piece of information about movies and popular songs that were inspired or caused by war. As we move through this particular section, we come into more of the amphibious exhibits like this one right here and then also learning a little bit more about the undersea war that was going on with the submarines. Now the submarines, it's kind of hard to grasp always how big they actually are. We saw a mini sub a while ago and that's a tiny 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 one in comparison to these massive ships that hold so many people. So this illustration helps a little bit. As you can see here, it shows you a little bit about how people would fit in there and what rooms would be available to them. It's still kind of hard to completely understand the size though. This behind me could help a little bit, but it's not a full sub. So what's inside this room is only a small taste. This display is designed to look very similar to what a sub might look like on the inside. Of course, it's cavernous sounding and echoes a lot. This image right here is one that you can find in many places, but they do have an actual monument that looks exactly like this that you can go and view if you're ever in the Washington DC area. The story behind this, however, is right here. And you can learn a little bit more about it in the museum. These men were the men that were featured in this photo. Sergeant Michael Strank was an immigrant from Czechoslovakia. He was killed in action two weeks after raising the flag. Corporal Harlan Block was from Westlaco, Texas, and he was killed in action the same day. Private First Class Franklin Salzy was from Kentucky. He was killed by a sniper. 1945. Private First Class Rene Gagnon was shipped stateside for the cross-country war bond tour. Private First Class Harold H. Schultz was badly wounded in action later in the battle. And Private First Class Ira Hayes was a Pima Indian who was also sent on the war bond tour. Now before the war, these men didn't know each other and they definitely didn't know that they were going to be taking one of the most iconic photos that most people see and can instantly recognize. As you can see, not all of them had fates that were positive and not all of them had similar backgrounds. In this moment right now, right in this moment where they're raising the flag, it didn't matter who they were, where they came from, how they were different, they were all right there in that moment together. And coming to places like this with all of the very hard to swallow details and the really deep thoughts that go into it, it can be really heavy. But one of the things that I like to do is find the positive when going to places. And I think that this photo speaks more than a thousand words. It won a Pulitzer Prize and 
I think that it did so not just because of the war and the context, but because of what they don't think of. The fact that these men, again, were from different walks of life, different backgrounds, and in this moment, it really didn't matter. They were there together. The destroyer USS Hugh W. Hadley is north of Okinawa. Her mission? To protect ships and troops from Japanese aircraft. The narration within each one of these allows you to envision those characters sitting there, right there in that scene, going through these steps. And it allows you to think. Think well beyond just the staticness of it sitting there and into what it actually is and what it would be like to be there that day. On a side note, guys, this place is so big, I think I just got lost. Wow, boy, did I miss this entire area. And what a shame that would have been if I wouldn't have found it again. So what we are looking at is a 40-foot barge. It has a blue hull rather than a regulation black hole for Nimitz. And as you can see right here on the end, he has his four stars. Now the barge itself is 35 feet long and it was built in Philadelphia at the Naval Shipyard in 1938. So to have this where we can see it, is something that I would have never thought of. I think of the big ships and things like that, but I never think of things like this. And that's so epic. And this right here is considered to be a Japanese Rex float plane. It is 34 feet long and nine inches. We are now entering into probably the most notable portion that most people remember about the war because it's the part that we are educated about on a larger scale in schools. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, many things happened between, as you have seen, and as a result, it finally got to a portion where there was pressure on the Japanese to basically lay down their arms and say, we are done. It wasn't just the United States who was saying that, it was all of the allied nations because Japan was posing a massive threat and they refused. So the Americans used something they had never used before, a nuclear weapon. Now, nuclear weapons in today's world are considered vastly different. Again, like many of the other things, technology has changed. However, at the time, because this was so unheard of, the instantaneous stop based on impact occurred. There were two bombs that were dropped, one in Nagasaki and one in Hiroshima. This is a portion of history we are often told about, but the stuff that led up to this is sometimes stuff that we haven't seen along the way. So to see this entire story play out and get to the point where we were here has been quite eye-opening and also concerning. This is what the bomb vehicle would have looked like. It's huge. If you have followed some of my other videos and seen some of the other things that we've looked at, Nothing compares to this in way of size whatsoever. Now keep in mind, there are entire areas in both New Mexico and Nevada where you still cannot go there because they test all sorts of explosives. But no one, no one could have ever understood the impact that this would have had, I don't think, even with all that testing. Nagasaki went from a thriving normal city to rubble and so did Hiroshima. Following this horrific loss there was unconditional surrender and defeat was had. Of the United States, Great Britain, China and the Soviet Union that our empire is willing to accept the provisions of the joint declaration.
Following the surrender, some of the most iconic images that we probably have ever seen were taken. And we can find several of those right here in the gallery. This one right here in particular, most people have seen it. But then, after the war, with that very different America, we start to count the loss. And we move into this hall where we see the overall impact. Now, I have visited several other locations before where we've talked about this, just how many people were impacted by this. But once again, the losses are staggering. That was the Museum of the Pacific War. I hope that you have enjoyed learning with me today. This has been a different kind of experience than we normally go on when we're in our lighthearted adventures, but it is a very necessary stop along the way. And I wanna encourage you guys to find locations, not only this one, but others like it in your area. Until next time, guys, make sure that you subscribe, throw the thumbs up and check out the interactive map for other places that you also can go on your adventures. And I'll see you guys next time.